When did you start? Okay, cool. All right, welcome back from lunch. Tough time slot, everyone's gonna fall asleep. Awesome. So uh, welcome back. I'm gonna be talking a little bit here about uh, attacking Microsoft Kerberos. Some of the uh, uh, cool attacks I figured out. Um, presented this at DerbyCon last year. Obligatory slide on, oh sweet. This clicker accidentally clicked about 30 seconds ago. Now it has no clicking at all. My day rocks. All right, so the ob obligatory slide, who am I? Tim Medin, I work for a company called Counterhack. I'm also an instructor with SANS. Do a bunch of other stuff. If you want, there's a QR code to do the contact information. It also includes a link to the slides and the tools when he wants it. Because when we come to the presentation like this, people are like, yeah, like I'm clicking on that, right? Okay. Still, nobody, there's one guy, thanks. Jose knows me, so he knows that. <laughs> he's already owned, so that's why he's, he's gonna do it, he's okay. Yeah. yeah. Let me just kick, kick PowerPoint once again. You think I'd never done this before? That's what, this is what Macs are supposed to be good at. Yes. All right, what is Kerberos? Kerberos is the uh, authentication used by Microsoft in the Windows domain. Also, the three-headed dog that guards the gates of hell. Yeah. Same thing, right? <laughs> Rough crowd, man. All right. Get some more. Can we bring the beer card in here? All right, so <laughs> the, uh, the, the, we're going to be focusing on the, uh, the first piece here, the, uh, the Microsoft version, the, the uh, authentication. How many of you guys have heard of things like Golden Ticket? With uh, Mimic Cats, Benjamin Delpy, stuff like that. We'll talk about, a little bit about that, how that fits in, and how he completely hosts me. So a little bit of an overview. What are we going to be talking about? Um, the long, I like to do my presentations backwards. Anybody else a little ADD? Like three of you? The rest of you probably weren't paying attention, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's fine. I get it. I, that's how I roll. I like to do my presentations backwards. So I'm going to do the demo first, and then we'll do the long part, the long description of how it works later. So if you see the demo, you're like, that sucked. I don't care if you leave. I'm fine with that. <laughs> do what you got to do. So what can we do here? So with this attack, what we can do is we can crack passwords for remote services. That's cool. We can do it without sending a single packet to that service. So I don't have to have network connection to it. It doesn't have to be uh, accessible with a firewall. Frankly, it doesn't have to be up. It doesn't have to be existent anymore. As long as that service account still exists, we can use that for attack. Uh, as any user. I don't have to be domain admin. I don't have to be a local admin. I can be any user on a box. Also, offline cracking. What's the benefit for an offline attack versus an online guessing? Stealth. Stealth, yeah, there's, there's, there's no logs. What else? Speed. You're going to get millions of attempts per second versus three, four, ten. So orders of magnitude faster. We do all this again as any user without uh, actually connecting to the device. Well, then at later points, after we do the, uh, the first piece, I'll do a second demo where we're going to use that to rewrite some of the tickets. So here's what we're going to do real high level, real quick. I'll come back and explain what each of these pieces do and why it's important. First, we're going to find the service accounts. There's a mapping between the service accounts and, and the SPN. We're going to ignore the computer accounts. Well, again, we'll come back to why that's important in a little bit. We'll get a whole bunch of tickets, extract them from RAM, crack it, and get the, the credential for the remote service. Okay? So let me flip over now to my Windows box. So I've got a domain here. By the way, sorry for the, the jitter. Apparently there's an air conditioner right above both of these in the School of Engineering. No one thought of this? <laughs> <laughs> Just saying. Let me scroll back up here. Let me clear a couple of things. All right, so the first thing we're going to do, I'll zoom in here just a second. We're going to see who I am. So a little information about my account. So my account is uh, TM, which is my first name, last name. Um, scroll down to my groups. I'm just a domain user, nothing special. Uh, who am I slash all? Did you guys know this command existed? Who am I the slash all? The slash all is amazing. It shows you, like, the SID, uh, you can get all sorts of group, group information associated with the SID with it. Awesome, awesome capability. Anyway, long story short, I'm a regular user on the domain. Locally, let's see who I am. 
So I'm going to say net uh, local local group. Gosh, this is hard to type. And this is why I copy and paste. Um, the group, the members of the administrator group are the administrator account and domain admins. So I am not a privileged user on the domain, and I am not a privileged user on this, on this box. As you should be, right? We want end users to have as few permissions as possible. So we have this box set up properly. I've actually patched all these systems, so they're the latest, greatest uh, patch versions as well. So let's try to copy and paste, because apparently I suck at typing. So we'll use a command called set SPA. I'll come back to the description of that here in just a second. But this shows me the mapping between user accounts and the services. So I can see the account, CN, domain controllers, uh, DC, Medine, local. I can see that I've got a bunch of these, uh, these. This account is tied to all of these SPNs. I'll come back to a little bit more description of, of this in just a second. We can also see that we have a lot of computer accounts. So when I authenticate to the remote box, the, the, uh, the service is going to be tied to a computer account. We also have sometimes where the service is associated with a user account. This is going to be more interesting to us. Anybody ever try to crack a password for a computer account? Yeah, good freaking luck, right? It's a randomized thing. You're not going to guess it. How many of you cracked a password for a user account? Yeah, everybody, right? People pick crappy passwords. So we're more interested in here when someone maps to a user account than a computer account. Again, we'll, we'll spend a little bit more detail here in just a second. I can take a look at my system. Whoops. K list. I can see the tickets that my system currently has with K list. I can scroll back up. I see my first couple of tickets. They're related to the KRBTGT. This is the one Kerberos account to rule them all. This is the account that's associated with the um, golden ticket. Also connecting to the DC, the domain controller. But what I want to do is I want to request a ticket for something else. So if we scroll back up here to my, did I scroll past it? Of course you guys don't know, right? Um, the web service account. So if I connect to the HTTP service on the server Web01, it maps to an underlying account with this descriptor. Long story short, it's the web service account. And it's a user account, which means someone set the password, the password might suck. So what I'm going to do is I'll request the ticket, a little bit of PowerShell magic. Paste this, whoops, control C, try that again. And now if I do K list again, I can see that I should have another ticket, which I do right here. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to use uh, Kerberos to extract that ticket, or sorry, Mimikatz to extract that ticket. And I'm going to use Kerberos export. Let me exit out of here. And we can see now we created a bunch of Kirby files. What I want to do now is use a tool that I wrote, and we're going to crack passwords based on those tickets. And we'll explain why this works in just a second. But from this, we're able to figure out that password one is the underlying password for our web service account. Now, that Web01 box, I'm going to try to ping Web01. It's not accessible. Frankly, this system is not even up. I have it powered off. If you come back over here and we look at my library, whoops, go back here. Virtual machine library, we can see this Web01 box is offline. Frankly, it could be, it could be nuked. Maybe the, the, the box is completely offline. We've destroyed that server. It's gone. But that mapping still exists in that Active Directory. So that even if you take the, the system offline, if this stuff's still floating around, you still have a, 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 some sort of an issue. All right, so offline cracking, a remote service is any user, and a service isn't even up. Awesome, that's fun, right? Now let's go back and see why does this actually work. By the way, if you guys have questions, shout them out at any time. Feel free. I like interactive. 
So let's talk a little bit, let's go a little bit of the backstory. We talked about the golden ticket. Golden ticket is cool, but in order for the golden ticket to work, I have to have a full domain compromise. I have to have control of the domain controller so I can get the password hash for the KRB TGT account. Once I have that, I can forge tickets for anybody. I can be anybody on your network. This, we're gonna use a lot earlier in some sort of pen test. Wow, this bounce is crazy. If you get the bounce just right, it stays in place. Um, this is not gonna be your initial compromise in the network. So someone gets access to the network, they can use this to extend their rates, potentially get access to, to other systems and other accounts. Now, if we crack that service account just a second ago for the, the web service, where's a box where I know that credential is going to work? The web server, right? The, the web server, the, app, the, the, the service itself is running under the context of that web service account. So I know that that thing can do, has some permissions on that box. Luckily, I can take it and bounce it right back in. We can try it in other accounts, other SIFs. We'll see why in just a little bit why Kerber, sorry, by why SQL Server is very, very interesting. Why does all of this work? Well, as part of Kerberos, there's some secret things all over the place. I talk to the domain controller, and it encrypts something and gives it to me. I take half, I give it to the other service, all encrypted. There is one thing that is unknown, one secret from system to system in a domain. What is it? password hash, right? That's it. The password hash, that is the only thing. So what it's doing is it's encrypting the tickets with the password hash. So what I can do is I can say, I want a ticket for the web server. And what I can try to do is I can take a password guess, hash it, try to decrypt. Decrypt is successful. Boom, I know I got the right password. If it doesn't, I try again. Guess, hash, decrypt. Guess, hash, decrypt. Guess, guess, hash, decrypt. Boom, success. Now I've got a, uh, a proper password, okay? So we use this MTLM path, uh, MTLM hash. That is the one secret that we use everywhere. So now how does Kerberos work? I got some fancy pantsy drawings here that took me threes of minutes to put together. <laughs> we have my box here on the left, okay? It jumps on the network, it says, I want to talk to things, I want to communicate to things. So it puts a request in to the domain controller. I verify myself to the domain controller by request by encrypting it with my hash. KDC can also has my hash, it can decrypt, and it's gonna send back a TGT. Think of this like a carnival, all right? You've got one entrance ticket that allows you to ride the other rides. And then after that, you get additional tickets for each ride that you want to play with. So I, I've got this ticket granting ticket. Now if I want to connect to something else, I now send that TGT back to the domain controller and say, hey, I want to connect to his web server. The domain controller says, your ticket looks good. You have permission to, to get additional tickets. Here's the ticket. Now the domain controller doesn't, doesn't know if I have permissions or not. It's not his call. That would completely overwhelm the domain controller if it knew every permission for everything across the entire network. It pushes that off to the web server. So it's going to give a ticket back to him. I'm going to send my ticket, my half of this ticket, I actually get two pieces here, to him, and he's going to say, go, no go. Okay? So the two pieces I get back, one piece I'm going to keep, one piece I'm going to pass along to the remote service. So the piece I send across to the remote service Guess what this is encrypted with? This guy's hash, right? So he decrypts it. He knows that I got it from the KDC because the KDC has the hash. So it decrypts it. It then says, hey, is the user the right user in the right groups? Fill in the blank. Boom, I have access or not. Make sense so far? Like I said, feel free to ask questions at any point in time. All right, so now I've sent my ticket over uh, to this guy. Now what's inside these pieces of tickets? There's obviously much more to it than just these, these couple of pieces. But in the server piece, it's got information about me. Who am I? What groups am I a part of? Uh, there's also an additional session key. So after the initial exchange, it'll actually transition over to that specific session key and uh, these different encryption keys. Again, encrypted with the server's hash. 
my piece, the piece that I keep, because I give the TGT to the domain controller, he gives me the ticket for the service, my piece tells me how long the ticket is valid for. It tells me the session key, because remember these two pieces have to match, because when we switch to the encrypted, we have to make sure that we're both encrypting with the same key. Holy smoke, they're vibrating a lot. And it's going to be encrypted with my TGT session key. Okay? So you guys see how that's going back and forth, how we have a little bit of this back and forth? I read the RFCs for this crap so you wouldn't have to. You're welcome. All right? <laughs> they are brutal. Anybody read RFCs before? Anybody else in the Somniac? In Somniac? Notice these two groups don't overlap. <laughs> or sometimes they do. But uh, yeah, rough, dry reading. So this SPN, I talked about the SPN a little bit earlier. Here's what the SPN is. The SPN is a mapping. So I want to authenticate to a service. I have no clue what account is being used in the underlying service, right? I shouldn't have to. That's not my problem. That's Kerberos' and the domain's problem. Because when I connect to this, when I, let me go back a slide. When I connect to this guy, I don't know his account. I certainly should not have his hash. But the domain controller is going to have to look that up to make sure that it encrypts that half of the ticket using the proper hash, right? Here's how it does that lookup with SPNs, okay? So the remote box is, hey, you should authenticate. Okay, I'd love to. I talk to the KEC and I say, all I know is this guy is a web server and here's his name. The, K, the, the KDC, the, the key distribution center, also the domain controller, I'm gonna use those terms interchangeably, DC, KDC, whatever, um, it has a mapping. We saw that with our set SPN tool just a little bit ago. We saw the mapping between user accounts and the service. So the service here, let's say I want to connect to cliff.medine.local and I want to connect to it for mail. I don't know the underlying account, the KDC does. It's going to say, oh, you're connecting to cliff, you're connecting to this service. I need to encrypt with this account credential. And this can be whatever name, right? Oh, you're connected to the web server on Charlotte? Here's the account that's underlying used here. And we can use a tool called set SPN to set up that mapping. Okay, so it, KDC has this giant list of information. We can actually re we query the domain controller and get some of this information as well. So here's some other interesting ones as well. So we've got MySQL or MS SQL, et cetera. It's going to uniquely identify the service. And there's a bunch of different specs on how this works. We've got the service type up front. There's a big long document with various uh, service types. We've got the host name. We can add a port, because sometimes we'll run a web server on a weird port. And we can add the DN if we need it. I very rarely see that. Usually we'll see service type, host name, sometimes a port. Okay? So these are the different names we have. And there's how we set up the mapping. So if my server one box is running a web server, and I want to map it to the web service account, this is how I do it. Now, obviously, to run that, I have to be a privileged user. So that's how we do our mapping. We can set SPN to, to search. Here's my service types, as we showed you. Getting crackable tickets. This is important, right? I don't want to spend CPU cycles on things that realistically I'm not going to get unless I'm inside the NSA. That's a joke. Nobody? <laughs> we need this beer card back. Um, yeah, <laughs> half of the people who work for the NSA. Like, we already got this recording. Don't worry. <laughs> so we can, we can query the domain controller and say, hey, what do we have that's, that's mapped to what? So I can say, Set SPN, I can say dash F for forest or dash T for domain. Because Microsoft and spelling, I guess, I don't know. Target, I guess, but I don't know why they went, but forest is, I don't know. Anyway, so dash T, I specify my domain. Dash Q stands for query. And I want all the things. All the, ser the service names, all the host names. And give, it, give them all to me. And what I can do is I can manually look through and say, hey, you know what? The SQL server box here on SQL01 with this, with this uh, name is mapped to SQL Engine. SQL Engine is, a mem is in 
this specific group, the users group. Meaning likely, it's actually a user account. Some person probably generated this password. People are terrified of changing credentials for services, especially big important things like SQL servers, right? Salesmen love it when SQL servers go down because then they go to the bar and drink all day, right? <laughs> the, the work shuts down when the bad database is done. So we don't change those things. You, you, how many, you, you probably all have these servers. You, you walk into the server room and you don't make direct eye contact with it <laughs> and you back out slowly. <laughs> and once a year you bring a bunch of fruit to it. <laughs> yeah, we, we all had those boxes, right? Because if you make that box mad and you stare at it for too long, it's like, screw you, I quit. <laughs> and it never happens except Friday at 4 o'clock, too, right? <laughs> or at 2 in the morning. You're laughing because this is so true. So anyways, you had a SQL box. People aren't going to change this credential. Which means if we're doing our cracking, we can let our cracking run for a very very long period of time before a rotation would ever happen, if ever, frankly. User accounts, you know, we rotate. Service accounts, very, very, very rarely to see that. Uh, we see the exchange box here. So we've got IMAP, the name, exchange01 is our server, and that's mapped to uh, the underlying computer account. The underlying computer account is going to have a password that Frankly, we're not going to guess. It's completely, it's, it's good, it's good enough randomness that it's just not going to happen. We're not going to guess that. We could offline crack it, but again, unless you're inside the NSA, good friggin' luck. So we can get these tickets. Now, going through a pile of these manually is going to be, as we call technical terms, the suck, right? So we got some better ways. I wrote a couple of tools in PowerShell and VBS. So depending on the remote system, we, it'll work. Uh, supports PowerShell v1, so we get older systems. But what this does is it will ask the, the KDC, say, hey, or the domain controller, hey, I'd like all of these mappings, the mappings that we saw when I ran set SPN, I'd like all of those. Oh, and by the way, I only want the user ones. Don't bother, don't, don't waste my time with computer accounts. So that means I'm likely to get ones that I'm, more, I'm gonna be more able to crack. And again, PS1, we get PowerShell, as well as VBS. So you can run into all sorts of, sorts of systems. If you can crack that computer account, let's talk. I will gladly buy you all the beers. Just say it. So requesting the tickets. Now this is a little bit funky. Again, you can feel free to grab the slides afterwards. Um, but we use a little bit of PowerShell. This is going to grab specifically one ticket, which is what we did just a second ago, where I grabbed one ticket for the web server web server that wasn't even up, but the web server nonetheless. We can do a little bit of kung fu here and get a lot more tickets, or we can use the tool we had in the previous page with a little bit of uh, mojo to, to make the data look a little bit different. We can massage it, get very specific information. Yeah, the elevator is the ESPN command, right? Nope. Nope. That, nope. I'm a regular user over here. Come on, switch, there we go. Yeah. Who am I slash all? I am just a regular old user, and I'm not elevated on my box. Is there a reason that a non-elevated account would need to request tickets like this, or is it just like a... Well, if I want to authenticate to anything, then yes. I mean, so frankly, yeah, you have to. So if I want to talk to anything, I have to be able to re request tickets. So there is a specific log item. I think I've got it later in the notes. There's a jump ahead. Great question. So his question was, do we need to request? Do we need to do, be able to do this kind of stuff? Well, yes, if you want to authenticate. And of course, if we're in a domain, we very much want to. So um, there is a very specific item that will be in the domain controller's log that says, hey, somebody requested a ticket. <coughs> of course, everybody requests tickets. In this case, if I'm going for one ticket and I'm the bad guy, good freaking luck. Good luck, because I'm blending in. Now, if I start mass requesting tickets, you can find that really easy. Your SIM, if it's looking for this information, which at this point in time, I don't believe any of them are, um, you should be able to be alerted to somebody requesting a mass quantity of tickets. 
Of course, you could go nice, low, and slow, hide from the IPS, whatever. Okay, did that answer your question? Yeah. Awesome. So as we mentioned before, if I'm requesting a ticket, box doesn't have to be up, doesn't have to be accessible from where I am. It just has to still have that mapping. A lot of people, when they decommission a box, they'll leave the accounts floating around. They'll leave the mapping still in place. Maybe they moved from an old SQL server to a new SQL server and left the old account floating around. You know, you have to, you have to make sure that you clean up to prevent some of this. So we have the ticket for the remote system. It's encrypted with what? I mentioned this a bunch of times. I'm trying to make you guys interact, OK? You know it's rough. We're IT people. The room fills from the back to the front, except for this gentleman. <laughs> you a Linux admin, by the way? Yes, yeah, I. He nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> no offense. All right, so <laughs> I crack myself up sometimes. Oh, I lost my train of thought too. Oh, where were we? So the ticket is is encrypted <coughs> with the the remote services hash. We can pull that back and try to crack it now. I tried, I wrote this in Python, so it's not super fast. Any of you guys done any sort of like threading or multiprocessor stuff? No, I see a couple people are like, mm -hmm, I tried. <laughs> so I test, I, I wrote this thing, I gave it to a couple of friends of mine, actually Mick had it, and his coworker's like, oh, I was using your tool, and I still let you know this cool threading stuff, and I tried all sorts of different threads, and the fastest speed I could get was with one thread. <laughs> like, dude, I suck so bad at that. Anyway, uh, I'm working on a module for John. If you've ever looked at, looked at the John the Ripper code, it's horrific. And they're sort of proud about that. They're like, is there any documentation on this? If you can't read the code, you shouldn't be programming. Screw you guys. <laughs> so I'm slowly making it through with a lot of their crappy comments trying to figure out what's going on. So have, hopefully you'll get what we, what, we like to, what we like to call real threading here very shortly. All right, so we cracked the password, the remote, the, the remote password. Now what? We can log back into that box. So I cracked the service account, the underlying service account for the web server. I can probably log straight back into that box. I might be able to log into another box. I might be able to use it all over the place. That's kind of fun, right? Or maybe I'll see it's some sort of scheme and I can get additional passwords, lots of different information we can use. Or, because the ticket is encrypted with that hash and I now can generate the hash, I can make my own tickets or modify the tickets. So that uh, makes this a, a lot of fun. So we'll jump into that in just, in just a second. I also have an additional tool that will um, extract this, these, these tickets the TGS uh, request tickets from packet captures and put them in a crackable format. <coughs> yes? So his question is, um, after, after so the, the ticket's encrypted with using the NTLM hash as the key, what's the encryption type? It is crap. Now I can't remember off the top of my head. I think it's an RC4 from a, it's a stream cipher off the top of my head. I'll have to see off the top of my head. It doesn't matter, we got the key, right? Screw, screw the heart attacks, this is easier. All right, I, I, I'm completely blanking at this point then. I can check my code, it's in there. Um, so, how does, I, I send my ticket to the remote box. The remote box makes the decision whether it should let me in or not. Right? How does it make that decision? It does it with the privilege attribute certificate, or the PAC, we call it. The PAC contains all sorts of information about me. It contains my username. It contains my RID, so I can see my user RID. That's the big long SID, security identifier. The RID is the relative identifier, that last little piece at the end. It maps to my user account. It also tells me the groups I'm a member of. So if I, make it, if I can decrypt this ticket, and I can re-encrypt this ticket, I can change anything in the ticket, and then resend it to the remote box, right? Well, sort of. It's protected with a couple signatures. 
Now we have one secret thing in the domain for each, for each box. It's got its hash. So the server checksum, guess what the key is for that checksum? The hash. So I can change the thing and I can re-sign it because I've got that. Awesome. But then we've got the other guy. The other guy is signed with the KR, KRB TGT's password hash. And if I've got that already, I frankly don't need to use this at this point in time. So wouldn't it be nice if Windows didn't always check that other signature? Because the system can check this signature itself, right? It has the hash, it knows its own hash, it can decrypt it using the hash, it can damn well check the, the, check the signature. But to check the, the signature on the KRB TGT, I know I look there, we're going a little limp yeah. there. To, to, to check the signature using the KRB TGT, either my box has to have that hash, or we have to send it to the domain controller to verify. That takes extra overhead. So if every single time I want to authenticate, I'd be like, give me a second here. I pass with the domain controller, it comes back. Not only is there additional latency there, but the domain controller is going to take a lot more burden. It's going to have to verify a lot more of this information. And this, by the way, this verification channel uses a secure TCP uh, communication, so you can't just inject things with like UDP. So the server will check its own. Sometimes it will ask the KDC. Sometimes. Not all the time. This is where things start to break down. According to the doc here, Windows OS sends the pack validation messages to the main controller, the net logon service. Um, if it does not have the act as part of the operating system privilege. Basically, if this thing runs as a service on my local box, it says, I'm too important to waste time on this. I'm not going to bother checking. So guess what runs as a service on, on boxes like this? SQL Server? Awesome. That's where all the cool data is. Unfortunately, this won't work with web because there's an abstraction layer when it comes down to the, uh, the web and the app pools. So an app pool will always verify with the KDC. So this isn't going to work with web servers. But it does work with a lot of other cool things. Exchange, SQL Server. And the beautiful thing with SQL Server is during the install process, it says, Hey, we suggest you use other accounts. Why don't you give us the names and passwords for those accounts? So it helps set it up in this sort of a manner. Now you can toggle a specific setting that says always ask the domain controller. But good luck pulling it off in your network. Add a couple of milliseconds of, of a delay to every single query and watch people start screaming at you. Because that will start to stack after a while. You have some big problems. So frankly, it's just not going to happen. On top of this with SQL Server is there's a couple of documents. Microsoft has this like four page document on properly setting up the account so it will register this, the, the SPN and get that all squared away. It's four pages. Or if you make the, the SQL Server account a domain admin, it fixes all the problems. Guess what people pick? We'll change it later, right? <laughs> Lat later is Latin for, yeah, not really, ever. Yeah, so it's not going to happen. Microsoft tells you not to do this. A lot of the blogs out there do. If you look for this and you, add, you say, how do I set up SQL Server to use Kerberos? A lot of the blogs just say, screw it, make it a domain administrator. It doesn't matter. Oh, sweet. Made my job a lot easier. Um, Another important thing with, with SQL Server is it, get, it asks us the account, because remember we want to make sure we use a user account, not a computer account. SMB will use the computer account by default. And I've never seen anybody remap this. In fact, I'm not quite sure why you would. Um, exchange defaults to, that should say computer account. You can change it, but it takes a little bit more effort, not too bad. And HTTP uses app, pool, app pools. So what we can do then is we can start to rewrite tickets. Rewriting ticket is tons of fun. Now, I wrote a tool to do this. I, sp I spoke about this at DerbyCon. There was another guy doing a talk at DerbyCon on Friday. My talk is Saturday. And I'm freaking out that the other dude is going to release the same stuff I've been working on. 
I've been sh I've been shopping around this talk for like I don't know almost a year, and everyone kept turning it down. I'm like, no, 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 this stuff is fun, and I'm like, oh great, this guy's gonna blow it the day before. So I go through his talk and I sit there, and I super excited because he didn't break anything. So the next morning I'm waking up, I'm like, oh, it's gonna be a good day. We do my talk. It's Derby Con. This is gonna be so much fun. I roll over, I look at my phone, my buddy's, my, my buddy's got a talk at, uh, at like 9 o'clock, I'm a little bit late. I'm like, yeah, what's, what's, what's going on on Twitter? So Benjamin Delpy, the guy who wrote Mimicats, it's a freaking Saturday, okay? <laughs> the dude releases the exact same tool, he did it better, and <laughs> on a freaking Saturday, he beat me by like four hours. And I'm like, Ben, you're killing me, man. So he shows all this cool stuff about how he's doing this silver ticket. He's a super friendly guy. Um, so we've been, we've been we, that that morning. I spent a bunch of time rewriting slides, um, talking with him. I found a bunch of bugs in it. In fact, while I was playing, I was communicating with him. I needed to send him some tickets, and I sent him. Anybody familiar with the golden tickets? Anybody see that first attachment I added by accident? That's the KRB TGT. That is the one ticket to rule them all. It encrypts the, ev like everything. It signs everything. I accidentally send the guy who wrote Mimicats the keys to my domain. <laughs> this day is awesome. <laughs> it's going so well. <laughs> so yeah, so I'm frantically freaking out. I'm like, dude, you totally stole my thunder. And he's a super nice guy. He's like, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. I'm like, you couldn't take one day off. I mean, you're French. I mean, you could take every day off. Take a Saturday. <laughs> Any Frenchmen in here? Pretty good. Uh, uh, <laughs> Sacre bleu! You offended the French! So what we can do... That was supposed to be a joke. <laughs> so um, what we can do is we can use Mimicast to generate and, and play with our own tickets. Okay? So let me jump back to my box here. <laughs> Oh, I forgot to show you too. Here's my get all the tickets real quick in one line. K list. There's all the tickets from the entire domain. Um, and then we can extract them with curb with um, Mimicats. Extract them all. And then crack them all. So we got a bunch of passwords for, for all the accounts. The one we're specifically going to look at here is going to be SQL Server, because SQL Server is the one that is special oftentimes in these domains. The password we found here is Phoenix1. So the underlying password for this service account running SQL Server is Phoenix1. Okay. So let me kill everything here. I just, I'm just clearing out all the tickets, deleting all the tickets I had on, file, on my disk. So I'm going to try to connect to the SQL Server. And you'll see, we saw before, I have no sp special permissions. In fact, if I try to connect to the SQL Server, it tells me log and fail. I don't have permissions. But I know the password, that's the underlying password for that account, right? So what I can do is I can rewrite that ticket. Uh, we already cracked the password. I want sorry, my copy and paste apparently is sucking. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change that ticket. Oops, name cats. I'm going to change the ticket, and if we take a look up here, I'm going to change the red to 1159. If we take a look at what I had before, we can see my SID is 1106. So what I'm doing is, in that pack, it showed the red. I'm changing the red to be another user. So now, if I connect to SQL Server, and authenticate, now I've got access. 
Okay, so I'm impersonating the other user by using their writ. Now, who does SQL Server think I am? Always important, right? So let's go back to my notes and copy and paste this because uh, we got a new query. Paste. It still thinks I'm TM. That's my username. There's my SID. It's going to give us this long piece of information. If we look at the very, very end here, we can actually decode that last little piece. It's actually a big, long number. But if we decode that, it's going to show that, um, what number is it? 1106? 1159. This, the, the RID for Bob. Now, that's kind of fun. I can impersonate random users. But wouldn't it be fun to add some groups? The answer is yes, folks, yes, right? Because <laughs> right now, I look at the database, and I can see Bob's secret plans, but I can't see the plan for world domination. So Bob's secret plans, I can take a look at the table, uh, select the top 1,000 rows, and we see we get a little bit of information from this. Right? You guys watch? <laughs> It's the best documentary ever. Anybody watch Idiocracy? <laughs> awesome. Terrifying documentary. But anyway, so we see Bob's, Bob's secret messages, his things to do. But I can't read the plans for world domination. So what I'd like to do is read that. What's a group I would like to, have, uh, like to be a part of in the Windows domain? Administrators. Domain administrators. Yeah, absolutely. So let's go back here. Select this guy. <laughs> oh, Jesus. I don't think he's on my door. I, I, I put the two pieces. Wait, the sequel is not showing me. Oh, God. <laughs> so we'll connect back now. I am now, I added myself. If we take a look at my command here, we see groups that I added. 512 is, if I remember correctly, this is. Domain administrators, this is enterprise administrators, this is schema administrators, and this is one of the other administrators I added for good luck. <laughs> I don't need all these things, but why the hell not, right? So I connect to my database here, plans for world domination. I can now see the information. I can get the uh, plans for world domination here, and we see. Yes, South Park reference, right? So that's kind of fun. But at this point in time, we still see that I am authenticated as me. That's kind of boring. People are going to see what I'm doing on the box. Even though I don't technically have permissions, like they say, it's still going to be mapped in the logs that, hey, Tim did this. Now, I like to blame stuff on other people, right? <laughs> so, why not do that? So, who better than to, to blame things on than. Yeah, the Frenchman. I'm going to blame your mom, okay? <laughs> also, the RID is invalid. There is no user with a RID of 999. So forensically, if someone comes back and like, well, who dumped all the information? <laughs> I want to see somebody go to the CTO and be like, we were hacked by your mom. <laughs> Sorry, sir, what was that? <coughs> your mom hacked us. <laughs> So if I connect now, new query, execute, boom, your mom, right? We can also do other fun stuff. I think, oh, that's kind of fun. But what if instead of your mom, 
What if we change the name to something else? Like maybe, what if we use an invalid username? Paste this here. Right? So I can now use my username potentially as SQL injection. Maybe this is rendered on a page somewhere. I've got cross-site scripting. Oh, we have, we have so much fun to do with this, right? So, much, so many fun things we can do with this. Because everyone trusts a username to be safe. At this point in time, we can now start attacking all sorts of other fun things. Right? So my username now is says select star from pwned. We could put script alert boxes, beef hooks, maybe embed some sort of payload in there. Who knows? It's off to the races. Awesome, awesome capability. This will mean the, the SQL security schema, like that username is written back to the domain. Right? It is in the event logs. Let me double check. It's in the it's in the logs. No, no, no. It's gonna be a local. It'll check local. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't. This doesn't get passed back up. But if you check the logs on this box, I th we should see. Let me just show it real quick. We should be able to see a. Where's my SQL server? Why aren't you showing up? I want. Crap! I want to restore. There we go. We can try it real quick. Log security. <laughs> this is the local box. This is this this is this is this is, this is the SQL server. And I'm yeah, I have no idea what this maps back to, but that's the SQL server. It actually shows up in its event logs as that. So cool, huh? All right. What happens when you read that back to a SEM? Exactly, right? You start putting funky things into the SEMs, like, oh, yeah, it's safe. It's a username, right? Yeah, it's a lot. Good luck with that. <laughs> so we got a little extra time here, right? The mitigations. We got mitigations. The things we should do to protect against this. Here's good passwords, long and short of it. Here's a good password, right? In the more recent versions of PowerShell give us the capability and, and the domain. We can set up service accounts where the passwords will rotate automatically. It picks good ones. Do that. Okay? I know it, it sounds simple. Just pick good passwords. But people are terrified of changing service accounts. They don't want to break anything because they control important stuff. Also, look for this event ID. Right? So look for that event ID, and we'll see somebody requesting large quantities of tickets. Again, if they request one, good luck. You're not going to find that specific user. Okay, there's a really cool capability in uh, in uh, Mimikatz as well. You know, you, you do a get some things. Maybe you're compiling code, doing a large network scan. You got to blow off a little bit of steam, right? Nobody. I blow off a little bit of steam. All right, and if you're on a Windows box, not a lot of choices. So you get you get a little bit bored. You open up a little bit of Minesweeper, right? Like, yeah, yeah, it, that game sucks, right? Oh, you can't see my screen, can you? Hold on a sec. Sorry, this version of I updated the latest version of the uh, Windows for Mac, or what do you call it for Mac? All right, so we've we've, we've, we've got our. Minesweeper, you put it in the largest size, and it gets so frustrating because you're down to like a 50 50. Nobody's had this happen. <laughs> no one wants to admit it. All right. <laughs> no, I don't do games. I, I never play games at work. CD desktop. Uh, so, you got my Mimicats here. 
I got this bad guy, this here. Ben actually gave me a custom compiled version. He's a good guy. So you can do mimic find sweeper. It shows you where all the mines are. <laughs> so if you take nothing away from this, there you go. All right. So anyways, let's let me get this. All right, so that pretty much wraps it up. So what we did is we did some offline cracking of remote service accounts without sending a single packet to it because we used the uh, bad password. Bad password encrypts the ticket. We use that to crack the password. And then from there, we can start to rewrite tickets. I'm trying to get back to the very beginning here. Questions? Question is, if you denied someone shell access. shell access, would that put it, it would this hinder this? Yes, I very rarely see that. If you get access to someone's box, people will say, "Oh, well, whitelisting." Well, the shell is whitelisted. I mean, it's signed by Microsoft, so you can you can bypass that. Questions? None. All right. Well, thank you guys so much. Enjoy the uh, the rest of the day.